So as I said, um, the sort of basically the heart of what Snorkel is is this generative model idea. This idea how you can take a collection of noisy labeling functions and combine them in a way that I can estimate their accuracy in a, in a manner that doesn't require hand labeled data. And this is called the generative model. Generative model is a little overloaded as a term. Um, just to shake out some terminology here. When I say generative model, I mean it's learning some joint distribution of random variables, Let's say xy here. An example classifier that uses as a generative model is something like naive Bayes. When I say a discriminative model, um, it's a conditional probability, like of y given x. And that's something what we more classically think of as um, you know, these standard supervised learning machine, or, you know, these are all supervised learning, but standard um, uh, machine learning tools like SVM, support vector machine, logistic regression, deep neural networks. And so we frequently talk about running the generative model and then running the discriminative model. In our formulation, the generative model is modeling the, noi the, the noise over the labeling functions, and the discriminative model is the end model that actually builds our final classifier. Okay, so the general model really, um, the advantage here is it allows us to um, take a bunch of potentially very weak labelers from a variety of different sources and combine their input into one sort of interface, right? And one of the big ph philosophical things of Snorkel and this software 2.0 idea that Alex talked about this morning is that we really should be able to you know, modularize parts of the machine learning pipelines. We should be able to use whatever resources we have at the ready so for all of these information extraction tasks. If we have a bunch of different taggers for extracting chemical names, we should be able to wrap all of those up as labeling functions and put them into some machine learning model, right? There's no reason just to use one, especially if a huge amount of effort has gone into engineering these various things. And sort of the philosophy is, well, let's not leave anything on the field. Let's take advantage of absolutely everything we possibly could use in one interface and reason over the noise of those sources. These things could include, like we talked about this morning, knowledge bases. It could include other weak classifiers like taggers. It could be individual workers in a crowdsource setting. It could be you know, structured resources like dictionaries or lexicons. And of course, it could be just common sense domain knowledge that doesn't really, you know, that's best expressed in some sort of set of collection of rules or heuristics. Labeling functions sort of subsume their generalization of all these types of ideas. And the intuition, as Alex said this morning, was that you could think of the simplest way to think of a collection of labeling functions is as a, just an unweighted majority vote of all of the labelers, right? So the disadvantage of doing this approach, um, well, I said the, the advantage of this is as long as most people vote accurately, uh, more people improves the accuracy of majority vote. This is a, quite an old theorem. Um, majority vote can sometimes be quite a, a, a strong baseline, depending on what your rules look like. But the key thing is that if you were to take, in most applied settings, where you have something like, say, crowdsourcing, people's accuracies widely vary, especially if you're picking you know, things like hard, fundamentally challenging predictive or classification tasks. Just as an example, like in an application I've worked on with a bunch of cardiologists, predicting a particular cardiac malformation of the aortic valve, it's so challenging that like I had proposed maybe enlisting a bunch of cardiologist fellows to help us do with labeling and the senior people are like, mm, no, they're not gonna have enough skills to be able to do this really accurately and it requires quite a bit of effort on the cardiologist part and there was quite a bit of actual disagreement over some large collection of things to label. So even in, you know, domain expert settings, there is quite a bit of variability or noise and you'd like to sort of reason about that in a principled way. Um, this, of course, all this applies to even like your Amazon Turk setting where you have, you know, widely variable Turkers helping you do stuff. So what the generative model sets out to do is to learn these latent accuracies without access to labeled data by leveraging the degree to which labeling functions votes, the label matrix, overlaps and conflicts 
or how much you you know how much an, a labeling function will overlap and conflict with other labelers in the set. And Alex did a really nice job of outlining some sort of examples of that this morning. But the big intuition, again, just to reiterate, is that if a labeling function tends to agree with the majority vote, you tend to trust it more than a contrarian labeling function that tends to not vote with the majority. And how that actually plays out in the sort of sparse labeling space of how labeling functions really are, it can get complicated. Um, but that's the general intuition behind how uh, the gender model works. What this does, sort of under the hood, is you can think of this as a probabilistic graphical model in which the L labeling functions are uh, generating some vote output and you have some latent unseen variable, which is the true label of some data instance you are trying to uh, predict. Here in this simplified version, the edges are simply the accuracies of the labeling functions. There's some more complexities on top of this, like Alex pointed out, there's actually both an accuracy parameter and what's a propensity parameter, which is your likelihood to vote at all. Those are all just sort of nuts and bolts of how the generative model actually works. Uh, we won't dive too much into that. But just know that this provides a way to um, sort of inspect and estimate the degree to which, you know, to estimate these latent unseen accuracies of labeling functions. Snorkel can also go and look at how labeling functions have dependencies between them. So the assumption of the standard snorkel model is that every labeler votes independently, right? In practice, when you do real applications, we know that labeling functions often aren't independent. Sometimes that's not such a big deal in terms of in-model performance, but you can actually learn the dependency structure between labeling functions. Let's say labeling function two is correlated in its votes with labeling function three. You might want to model that in the probabilistic graphical model. If you knew that a priori, you could specify that structure to um, Snorkel, or you could actually learn it from unlabeled data directly. And there's actually a blog post by um, one of Chris Ray's former postdocs, who's now a professor at Brown, um, looking at how you can gain insight into structure of these types of weak labeled problems, basically by looking at unlabeled data. And there's a little code at the end of our generative model notebook that implements his um, sort of contribution there. And it, on average, in some experiments, that basically gives you a 1.5 F1 boost for free, the exact same input, just by automatically learning some of this correlation structure between your labeling functions. And again, this is all predicated on the fact that, you know, theory dictates that labeling functions are independent, but um, in fact, that's not often the case, but uh, the fact that things are correlated give you some insight into learning those dependencies. Practically, when does that happen? What if you're using a lot of multiple overlapping ontologies? There can be dependencies there that are difficult sort of to see or specify. You might have labeling functions like our, um, you know, longest length, uh, or ignore, you know, vote false if these entities are so many words apart. You could imagine, what if you had five such labeling functions where you just kept dialing up the length, right? The length at 30 subsumes the set of the length at five if you were to have two labeling functions. So there's some correlation structure in the votes of those labeling functions. Tunable parameters turn out to be a big deal if you jump out of the text domain. They show up in, in some text stuff, like for windowing size often. Um, but these continuous parameters show up a lot when you're running classifiers or writing weak labelers over things like images or time series, right? So there's a line of work um, in Chris's lab also looking at sort of interesting ways to tune those types of parameters and labeling functions more automatically, similarly inspecting unlabeled data. But one way around that is just to toss them in the model, right? Like, you know, five variations and then let the dependency learner sort of gain some insight into that structure automatically and sort of correct for it. So that's a valid strategy that can work in many cases. All right, so again, there's a lot more theory to motivate this stuff. Um, we won't dive into it, but um, you can talk to me and then Alex is really the, the, the main expert on the nuts and bolts of that from the theory side. He'll be here tomorrow again.
Um, so please, if you have theory, questions on that side, definitely flag someone down. Um, happy to answer stuff. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on actually how we train the generative model. So hopefully, is everyone's labeling functions, have, that all, have those all run end-to-end? -end? Okay, great. So, go and open this new notebook. All right. So again, uh, now we've sort of branched a little bit. The next two notebooks for the generative model discriminative model work on both the chemical disease tasks we've been looking at today, and then tomorrow, the mimic-based task. So uh, there's some additional code, which isn't that interesting, uh, for setting up which task you're in. Um, you can functionally ignore this. It just does all the setup so that we're in the right space. What we want to do is, again, assuming you've correctly uh, um, created all of your label matrices in the previous notebook, we want to just load those right back out of the database. And then, so that generates two matrices, train and dev. What we do now is then train our generative model. As far as parameters go, there's a number of parameters. Um, I would largely not focus on them for now. We've kind of defined a reasonable search space over you know, some parameters that kind of work you know, in practice for some of these data sets. That could wildly change based on how you guys have designed your labeling functions. Um, there's some uh, trickery there. I will also say that um, this is our sort of snorkel version 1.0 version of the generative model. There is a new version um, that has been recently put online. It's called Snorkel Metal. Uh, it does the same sort of probabilistic graphical model stuff, but it does it as this matrix uh, factorization formulation. What that boils down to is it's crazy fast over even insanely big candidate sets. The version we're looking at today, um, it totally runs, it interfaces with all the existing snorkel demo stuff, um, but it is slower when you have larger candidate sets, because it's order M, where let's say M is the number of candidates. The new snorkel metal stuff is order N, where N is the number of labeling functions, so it's dramatically an improvement and allows for more like interactive, immediate training of stuff. In all of the research projects, we've tend to start, we've sort of migrating to metal. It's still in a little bit of its uh, teething stages to get it up for common use. So um, just to make you guys aware of that, um, it's something you should check out, especially if you leave here today and want to start working on your own projects. It's probably good to start thinking about, you know, maybe using metal. All that said, again, we've just configured this. Um, LF propensity, I would just leave that for false. What this is, is a very, very simple random search hyperparameter tuning. Hopefully you guys are all sort of familiar with sort of ML stuff, but often, in, almost always in machine learning models, you have some space of parameters that you need to search over to get the best possible model performance. This is just a helper function that takes a search grid and searches over that space to find a model that does the best on our dev set which is again our little labeled true data set that we have at the ready. This is another reason why you want some gold labeled data is because it's very useful to actually tune your model using you know, a small dev set. All right, this is going to search over um, five possible models. And we can go ahead and just let this uh, run. should be fairly fast. Um, you see we get an F1 score, so I'm at uh, 68. That's sort of surprisingly good. Um, so can we do another like roll call? How many total labeling functions do you guys have? Uh, two, four, three, three, how many? Four. Four, okay. 
So we're almost done. You should probably be on the order of what I'm running. All right, so you see uh, it's pretty fast, even for, the, for this size of candidate, um, it's pretty snappy. If you're ambitious data scientists, like you know, probably everyone else in the room, you're already imagining running this on like a million documents from PubMed. That's where something like Metal really changes the, the, the time investment. Um, what do we have? We see that you know, our best F1 um, is you know, about 70, uh, while the worst is about 60, and it's just some function of how we're tuning these things. All right. <coughs> Can I ask what, what kind of numbers are people getting? Are they? Are they? 53. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's a pretty good distribution. So it, for an hour, right, of put, putts and around. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, oh, I accidentally reran that. That's unfortunate. Okay, so this is your first opportunity for a sanity check on what you're doing in a sort of meaningful way that isn't nose to the page, looking at labeling functions. What this plot's doing, what I did here is I say, um, let's just generate some statistics about um, uh, my labeling matrix. Let's print these out and that's useful, yeah. So that's just what my scores are on uh, dev data, which we saw before. This here is actually taking our label matrix, L-train, learning the noise model, and then merging all of the labeling functions to create one probabilistic label per training point. So this is basically our new set of labels that will be used to train, a, say, a deep learning model, right? Of the types of distributions of this marginals, I'm curious, how many look like this? Nobody? One? Okay. So this is, I will say, almost always the very first plot you see um, when generating labeling functions. I bet, are all of you including the CTD knowledge base in your labeling function set? So that's what really changes the dynamic here. If you were to remove that, I bet a lot of you would start looking at distributions like this. What this is, is it's saying, you know, of the zero to one probabilistic labels being emitted by my model, this is saying most of them are hovering around 0.5, which means you're just, you're not learning much, right? You're just around, hovering around random chance. Another common output is that you've done a really skewed distribution, right? You've rather written all positive labeling functions and maybe one negative or you flipped it. And what you see is that the histogram of distribution of predicted labels, you just are biased to one side or the other, right? You could imagine tuning your decision point, like a thresholding in your final model to try to, you know, get the right distribution. But in fact, this usually means you just need to write more labeling functions one way or the other. What you want in an idealized setting is something that looks more like this. Right, which says that you have good coverage on some set of positive and some are some sort of negative and some sort of positive examples. And then there is some space, which could be pretty big. This could be a whole nother group of them, right? Some space of labels where you're certain, some space where you're not. And that gives the, a nice balance to the model to actually learn some decision boundary under the hood to be able to make a classification. So as you can see, Using the, the CTD data set, you get pretty much that. There's some space where you're pretty confident they're negative. There's some space pretty big where you're confident they're positive. And then some middle ground where it, you know, it's, it can go either way. Yeah? Is there a way to incorporate the models or the, the label uncertainty into the machine learning model? That's exactly what this does. So I, I would say we're getting a little ahead. That's what effectively what 
is going on, if I'm understanding your question. So this has a probabilistic label, right, instead of a zero, one label. And that probabilistic label is given to our end model. Mm -hmm. So something where we're more certain or less certain, that information is conveyed to the model. Is that, is that, am I, okay, okay yeah, okay, great. We'll get to that in a little bit. That's jumping, you know, one or two steps ahead, but. Um, Yep. Labels and zero point five means we have no certainty. Yep. And then is the is the um, certainty and uncertainty just linear in between? So zero point two five means we're like effectively seventy five percent sure it's a zero and twenty five percent sure it's a one. Or is the well, I mean, if it were twenty five percent, it would be skewed to that. You'd be, it's yeah, you're very confident it's a negative, right? But it's not a absolute certainty and you're 75% confident it's true if you're on the flip side, so 75% probabilistic label, right? And so what that does, at the, it just, the in model side is it says, I'm gonna weight these you know, ones much higher than the 0.6s, right? So that, in the, however that translates into cross entropy loss, which is what's used to you know, tune the model, train the loss function for the model, that is used to you know, weight the featureization basically in some way. Okay, that's great, great questions. Okay. So what I can do is now um, we can take the generative model output and we can actually compute a score on our dev set, right? And so what, what is this saying? It's saying that um, I have about 54% precision. I have great recall. I'm finding virtually every true case that possibly could happen, but I still, you know, I'm generating a lot of false positives, right? So you could imagine tweaking your threshold, your beta in your model to get a better score. Right? Okay. I'm going to run this. So basically, after we've generated our, our model's results, we're going to save them to the database so that we can train our discriminative model in the next step. And we're running 53 to like 70, approximately. Are those are just the spread of scores amongst the people. Okay. All right, so last sort of bit, as I mentioned before, um, sometimes you want to learn some dependency structure amongst your labeling functions. There's code to do that here. Um, we won't actually get into the details of incorporating it quite yet, um, but this generates some uh, connection structure. So what this basically is telling us is that zero, labeling function zero is correlated with three, three is correlated with one, four is correlated with one. Um, yeah, so they have some structure, some connections between labeling functions that we've learned based on how they vote. And um, I won't backpedal to the specific named LFs, but sometimes the, depending on how you've set them up, it, the relationships make sense. And you can add these dependencies to the model above by just using this code. Basically, you just add this extra parameter dependencies to this code up here. Try to shut down. Yeah, so up here. I'd, I'd advise not running it now, just, just for the simplicity's sake, but. Um, Sorry, what are the three numbers in the end? For this one? So ignore the, th yeah, so the third number I would ignore, it's the type of dependency. Zero means a, like a correlation dependency. Um, theoretically, you can learn other types of dependencies, but that's not implemented. And it's largely, uh, you're making a theoretical decision whether you want to include the dependencies or not, right? Right. Often it's so cheap to compute them. So that's another thing that in metal 
is done much more elegantly. So like let's say you know you can define using like network X or some standard graph library a very clear dependency structure. That's just another input into the metal model and you can bake it in pretty easily as well learn it in some cases. Super, super important for images and sometimes important for text is sort of my empirical experience. Um, you can get very big gains in the image space where it makes sense that you have a lot of, um, when you're reasoning over primitives or like bounding boxes, there tends to be a lot of overlap and dependencies in image stuff. Okay, so everyone's run the model in end, hopefully. This is just reiterating how your marginals should look like and how they provide a, a sanity check. Basically shoot for good differentiation. And at this point, we've now done a full sort of snorkel loop short of the discriminative model, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, but we're gonna take this opportunity to revisit our labeling functions based on the information we found from running the generative model to make fixes or tweaks, right? So if you're in the you know 70, region, um, you should see if you can make it even higher. If you're on the 53, then you know there's definitely room to grow, just based on you know, other experience in the room. So how can you, you know, go back and fix stuff?